Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to our gospel broadcast. Let's seek the Lord for prayer before we begin. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for this opportunity to share God's word. Bless it as it goes out. Bless the talk to the boys and girls. We pray that we'll know your presence. Bless all the families of our church. You know every need, every situation, every circumstance. We commit all things to you. Turn our nation to God. Turn our leaders to God. Turn us to God. Help us to love you with all of our hearts. Lord, bless us now for Christ's sake. Amen. This morning, boys and girls, I talked to you about Felix Mendelssohn, one of the greatest composers of all time, one of the most famous musicians of all time, but he uses talent for the Lord. I want to talk to you about somebody else and this man also used his musical talent for the Lord. His name was Philip Bliss. He was American. He was a hymn writer. And if you look at your hymn book, you'll find many, many hymns written by Philip Bliss. Mendelssohn died. He was only 38. Philip Bliss too died. He was only 38. One was German. The other was American. Both are in the presence of God singing today. The train was hurtling north from Pennsylvania to Chicago. Philip Bliss and his wife, they had left their little children with friends and they were going to take part in a special New Year service in the great city of Chicago. Christmas had just taken place. But it was a very bad evening. Snow was blowing, a terrible blizzard. And the train was making its way north. And it was crossing a frozen river. And there was a crack. The bridge broke as the train was going across. And there was an awful accident. Philip Bliss was seen climbing out of a window. 
And then he went back to get his wife, but it seems she was trapped and a fire swept up through the carriages. And their bodies were never found. But in his case that survived, amazingly, they found a hymn. And the hymn was about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a hymn we have in our hymn book. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross. He suffered from the curse to set me free. And the hymn was later published. You see, Philip Bliss died. But his, his music continued. His hymns continued. Because the things that he believed in never died. You know, we will die and we'll go to be with the Lord, but we'll leave behind the things that we believed in. And Christ will continue and his word will continue. And that's why it's so important to live for the Lord. Everything else dies and perishes, but the things we do for the Lord continues on. Mr. Bliss grew up in a very poor home. He didn't even have shoes. He went about in his bare feet. His father and mother were very poor people. They didn't have much, but they knew the Lord. He was raised in the gospel. Boys and girls, what is important in life? It's not how much money you have or or what kind of car you drive, what kind of home you live in. It's nice to have these things. What is really important? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that home was a rich home because it had Christ. You know, there's people in this world that have lots and lots of money, but they're very poor because they don't have Christ. The only people that are truly rich are those that know the Lord. There are riches in heaven. And Philip Bliss's parents were poor people, but they were rich in the Lord. And they taught their children the gospel. And Philip Bliss came to know the Lord as a young man, but he also came to love music. And a talent that he had, it developed. And He could have made a lot of money by accepting jobs, teaching music in very posh colleges. But he also had an opportunity to share God's word, to become part of great evangelistic campaigns with preachers like Moody and Major Whittle. And he would be a great song leader who would lead the congregation in singing And he would also minister God's word on occasions as well. He did it for the Lord. He used his talent for the Lord. And today we still sing his hymns. And he's with the Lord today forever. You know, one of the last things he ever said publicly, it was a sermon he preached. And he didn't know, but death was coming very near. And he said this at the end of the sermon. And There were his own words from one of his own hymns. I know not the hour when my Lord shall come to take me away to his own dear home, but I know that his presence will lighten the gloom, and that will be glory for me. Lots of people were so sad when Philip Bliss died. Nobody could understand why God would take home so young such a man. He did so many good things for the Lord, but he's with Christ, and he's still with Christ today. Do you know the Lord is your saviour? Are you prepared to be with Christ forever? We're now going to read God's word together. And we're going to read from the book of Philippians chapter 3. And we have been going through the book of Philippians. The life of joy and peace. And that's what this book is all about. And we're going to focus upon Chapter 3, verses 4 to 9 this evening. The Apostle Paul is speaking. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, 
but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. We know that God will add his own blessing to the reading of his inspired word. Let us seek the Lord for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the word. We pray you would bless it to every heart. May the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen and amen. I've pointed out to you that chapters 3 and 4 are all about the Christian life. What is a Christian? This is a question that Paul answers many, many times throughout his epistles. And in chapters 3 and 4, we certainly learn what it is to be a Christian. We have noticed two things here so far about the Christian life from Philippians chapter 3 and 4. First of all, we have looked at rejoicing in the Lord. A Christian is one who rejoices in the Lord. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then last time, we thought about worshipping the Lord. A Christian is one who worships the Lord. He doesn't worship the Lord according to his flesh. He cannot present his own life, his own goodness, his own religion, his own knowledge of God's word, his own prayerfulness even. He can't present that to the Lord and say, here I am, please accept me. No, we worship the Lord in humility, in the spirit, looking to Christ. And this leads Paul now into a confession as to what it means to be saved. And the third aspect of the Christian life that we're going to consider is saved by the Lord. A Christian rejoices in the Lord, a Christian worships the Lord, but a Christian is saved by the Lord. And Paul here looks at what it means to be saved. He shares his own testimony. Testimonies are very important. When we share our testimony, we're sharing our own personal story, why we believe as we do, why we have hope as we do. It's so important that you have a testimony that you can share with others. Have you got that testimony? Can you talk to others about how the Lord has saved you, how the Lord has brought you from darkness to light? Paul was able to do that, and he does that in a very personal way here in Philippians chapter 3, to be saved. There's nothing more important in this world than to be saved and to know that we are saved. If you're not saved this evening, my prayer is that you would come to know Christ, that you would come to rest upon him and lean upon him. The word saved is used. I want to talk about what it means, what it means to be saved. And if you have any doubts, any misconceptions as to what salvation is well I pray that the fog will disappear and that if you don't know him that you will come to trust Christ tonight to know that you are saved nothing more important in the world saved by the Lord the first thing I want you to notice here about what it means to be saved is this the repudiation the saved person repudiates something you see Paul in the previous little section verses 2 and 3 was talking about worship and the importance of not having any confidence in the flesh not having, not having any confidence in who we are as we come before God that's what he says in verse 3 for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh and now Paul says if anyone could have confidence in the flesh. If anyone could come before God and present themselves because of who they are. I was that man. That's what verse 4 says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. I could have confidence in the flesh. Indeed, at one time he says, I did have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. If any of you think you have a, a life you can present before God and say, here is my life, you must be pleased with me because of who I am. I guarantee you, he said, I was better than you. I could present my life and present a greater argument than you could. If anyone could trust in the flesh, I could trust in the flesh more than anyone. And I dead. What then could Paul in his unconverted state have presented before the Lord? 
He presents seven things that he could have presented before the Lord. And he could have claimed, you must accept me on the basis of who I am. He was circumcised the eighth day, according to Jewish ritual, Jewish ceremony. He was a Jew. That set him apart as a Jew. He was of the stock of Israel. He wasn't just circumcised, but he came of the stock of Israel. He could trace his ancestry back to Israel, to Abraham. But he couldn't just trace his ancestry back to Abraham. He knew what tribe he belonged to. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He had the lineage. He had the pedigree. He said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was the best among the Hebrew people. As touching the law, he said it was a Pharisee. He belonged to the strictest sect of the Jews who prided themselves in their performance of duty, in their knowledge of the law, in the way they could, with great precision, live a life that seemed to be so good. He was zealous concerning zeal. He persecuted the church. So I persecuted the church, he did, but I, I did it out of zeal for the faith. I did it for God. Touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. He said if anyone in an outward way could have kept the law, he says, I did. He did everything he could. In fact, he said outwardly, before his peers, before his Jewish peers, he said, I was blameless. That didn't mean that he was sinless. He knew he wasn't sinless. He knew he broke the law in so many ways in, in attitude and character. He was aware of that. He became aware of that as he became conscious of his sinfulness. But yet, in regard to the outward performance of his duty, he said, I was blameless. But when Paul became saved, he repudiated all of this. He realized that all of this was worthless. It counted for nothing. The things he thought were good were really sin. They were worthless in the sight of God. And and that's what he had to repudiate. And that's why he said in verse 7, But what things were gained to me? These things were gained to me. I was so proud of these things. I counted them loss for Christ. They meant nothing. Because Christ, he, he made all these things pale away into insignificance. And then he, he puts it even stronger in the verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have counted the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may want Christ. These things, he says, whether it was my circumcision, my Jewish ancestry, my membership of the tribe of, of Benjamin, the fact that I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, the fact that I was a Pharisee, the fact that I had great zeal, the very fact that I had such a, a good, honorable, respectable religious life. I came to realize that all of these things were as dung, they were as filth. That's what Paul thought of them. They counted for nothing in the sight of a holy God. He repudiated all of these things. And the things that we think are good about our lives. If we're counting on these things to get us into heaven. To gain acceptance with God. We've got to realize that all these things that we think are good. They're as dung. They're worth nothing. We have to repudiate a dependency upon anything. That is not Christ. That takes away from Christ in relation to our Salvation. We've got to understand what this means to us today. Religion does not make us acceptable in the sight of God. God is not pleased with someone because they are a religious person. And it doesn't matter what religion we are, whether we are Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist. A religion in and of itself never makes us acceptable in the, right of, in the sight of God. If you're counting upon your religion to make you right in the sight of God, you've got to realize that your religion is but dung. It's taking you away from the Savior. A person may be devout. A person may be prayerful. A person may be principled. A person may be moral. A person may be generous. That person may be charitable, kind. All excellent characteristics. Characteristics that represent the very best of humanity. But yet these things cannot be presented before God and you cannot claim these things to get you access into heaven because we are all the while tainted by our sin. We must count them but dung, repudiate them because they will not enable us to gain access with God. 
A person may be exposed to the true religion, and the true religion is the religion that is of Christ. The true religion is that which is based upon the personal work of Jesus Christ. A person may know that gospel. A person may know God's word. A person may know what faith is even. And yet that person may not be a Christian. That person may be depending upon the fact that they attend a church, the fact they know the Bible, the fact they come from a Christian home. That person may even be depending upon some kind of commitment, some kind of decision that they made at a particular point in time. That person may be a hymn singer, a Bible carrier. That person may be a church attender. And that person may all the while be thinking, because I have these things, because I know these things, that that somehow makes me better than others. Makes you no better than others. I am no better than you because I stand behind this pulpit ministering God's word. I'm only a sinner. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross. I cling naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to that fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. It's Christ and Christ alone. We need to realize that. And we need to repudiate everything else if indeed we are depending upon that to get us into the presence of God. Look at Paul. As regards the very law, he was blameless. It seems he had everything, but he had to repudiate them, had to cast them away if he was to enter heaven. You may pray. You may be familiar with Scripture. You may have a respectable life. None of this merits you favor in the sight of God. In fact, that which is good becomes sin to you if you make it an idol. And you can make that which is good an idol if you think that somehow this makes you better than others. It makes you no better. There is none good. No, not one. What are you depending upon today? If you're depending upon anything that is not Christ and Christ alone, then you must repudiate that crutch. There is no merit, save the merits that are in our Saviour. So a saved person repudiates his sin, but he also repudiates his own self-righteousness, his own respectability, his own religion, his own goodness. He repudiates it all because it is worthless. But secondly, the saved person has an ambition. In repudiating that which could not save, Paul now had a new ambition. He wanted to know and to win the one who alone could save him. He says in verse 8, yea doubtless and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. That's his ambition now, to know Christ. He talks about winning Christ in the verse 8. This denotes a change. It denotes an instantaneous change. And that's what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. There was a change. He was coming along that road, intent on persecuting the church. Christ came. He was struck from that horse. He was blinded in the midst of the light. And he became a new man. Now he wanted to win Christ. And if you're to be a Christian, there needs to be a change. And that change can take place tonight. It can take place tonight where you are, in your home, wherever you're at. As you're listening, as you're watching, you can bow your head and you can cry to the Lord. You can submit yourself to the Lord alone for salvation. And there will be a change. He talks about winning Christ. Whenever somebody wins a prize, they have that prize within their grasp. It is not some kind of vague thing, is it? The prize is within their grasp. And to be a Christian isn't some kind of vague thing. Some people hope they will be in heaven. They hope they are Christians. They hope that God will accept them. But God wants you to win Christ, to know him, to have an experience, to trust him, to have him as your friend, as your brother, as your saviour. And to know that there must be that moment in time when you turn from darkness to light. This ambition is focused upon a person, isn't it? He talks about winning Christ. It's not about a religion. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a creed. It's about a person, principally. Salvation is about a person. It's about Jesus Christ, who alone can save you. And thank God, Christ is within your grasp. 
He is a prize that you can have. You can know him. You can have him. You can receive him. He can be yours today. If you but give your life to him. It's a real, genuine, personal experience. Paul is sharing his personal experience. Knowing Christ is a personal experience. Or will you repudiate all that's keeping you back? Whatever it is keeping you back from the Savior. Repudiate it all and give your heart to him that you might know him. So the Christian is somebody who repudiates that which is keeping him from Christ. That which he depends upon, which is not Christ. A Christian is someone who has this great ambition, the greatest ambition of all, to know Christ, to win Christ. But the Christian who is saved, the saved person, also has a possession. He possesses Christ. And this is what verse 9 is all about. A very powerful text. He says, I want to win Christ. I want to be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that, that, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. In knowing Christ, and being saved by Christ, Paul wanted the righteousness which is of God, the righteousness of Christ. That's what he wanted. You see, in his unconverted days, Paul was striving to be righteous, striving to do the right thing, striving to follow the Jewish way, the Jewish code, striving to follow the, Pharisee, the, the path of the Pharisee. But he was never righteous. But when he knew Christ, he discovered he was righteous, not through the righteousness that he could produce, but it was through the righteousness of Christ. And this word righteousness is the word justice. Righteousness and justice in the New Testament, it's the very same word. It's about being just before God. It's about being righteous before God. In Job chapter 9, verse 2, we have the great question, the greatest question that anyone can ask. How can a man be just with God? We are sinners. How can we be just with God? If, if we are to be accepted by this just God, this holy God, this righteous God, this God whom we were thinking about earlier today who dwells upon a throne and a river of fire flows out of that throne. If we are to be just before this God, how can we be just? We must be just. You see, in the Old Testament, and Paul was aware of this, the Jewish people were required to keep the law. Yet they broke the law. And because they broke the law, they had to bring their sacrifice, their offering. They brought their offering to make expiation, to make atonement, to appease the wrath of God through the presentation of the sacrifice. But there were many sacrifices. Every day there were sacrifices. There were special sacrifices for, for particular sins. There were annual sacrifices at set times. And so the sacrifices went on and on and on and on and on. And then one day Christ came and he died. And when he died, that which had never taken place before, suddenly took place. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom and people suddenly could see right into the holy place. And the priests that served were astonished. No more sacrifice required. This man, Christ Jesus, had come. And this was the truth that dawned upon Paul's heart on the road to Damascus. He discovered that this righteousness came through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ who died for him, even for him, who shed his blood for him, who rose again for him and suddenly there is life and suddenly there is acceptance through him. And this is alone what satisfies God, the righteousness of God. I am a sinner, you see. I cannot be accepted by God until God is satisfied. God will not be satisfied until I am righteous and I can only be righteous through Christ because I have no righteousness. This is the truth of justification and thank God for the penalty that Christ endured at the cross. Died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldest die for me? It was our sins that nailed him to the cross. He suffered the wrath of God for our sins, for every individual last one of our sins. And he shed the blood for our sins. 
And that is where justice was satisfied. And that is why we can be made righteous. We are made righteous, yes, through the life of Christ who lived a perfect life as a man for us, but we are also made righteous through the death of Christ as he shed that precious blood to make atonement all of the rites and rituals of all of those sacrifices of the Old Testament. They were fulfilled in him who is the Lamb of God who beareth away the sin of the world. And God accepted that sacrifice, therefore he rose again. And because he lives, we can live also. But our life can always be linked, must be linked with him, or we are dead. This is a life-changing truth. It's an it's a eternity-confirming truth. That we are righteous in Christ. That's what it is to win Christ. It is to have his righteousness. Martin Luther, he tried works. Is that priest? Is that monk? He tried works. He, he tried everything. He tried to be as good as he could. He, he tried to make atonement for his sins by suffering penance, by driving himself to the point of death, by starving himself, by whipping himself. His friends and colleagues, they were, they were worried about him. What would become of him? He was trying to be right in the sight of God. He never could. His conscience kept plaguing him until he discovered this truth that just shall live by faith. By faith alone. If I put my faith in Christ, I will have his righteousness. And suddenly the light came. And that truth changed the course of Europe. It changed the course of the world. The righteousness which is of God by faith. John Wesley was somebody else. Martin Luther was what we call a Roman Catholic. But, Martin, but John Wesley was a Protestant. He was not only a Protestant, he was a Protestant minister, raised in the manse, a man who went on to study at university, to take up holy orders. He became a missionary to the new colony of Georgia in America. He did all of this. And yet he wasn't a Christian. He didn't have peace. He didn't have hope. He was afraid of death, crossing the Atlantic. He saw others that had peace. We were truly saved, but he didn't have that peace. And it wasn't until he returned home from Georgia, a miserable failure. His reputation had suffered. The very best that he did was not enough. And in a little church in London, a little hall, he heard Luther being read. And suddenly his heart was strangely warmed because he realized it is only the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he repudiated all of those attempts to make himself right before God on account of his works. It was never enough. He came to know the Savior. This is something that changes lives. And how can you have the righteousness which is of God? It is by faith alone. Faith does not make us righteous. But faith is the means that God uses through which we are righteous. Because faith is a dependence upon Christ. An acceptance of the very best that we do. It is but filthy rags. And it is leaning upon the Saviour alone. Paul, you know, talked about the Jewish people. In Romans chapter 10. And he said there, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. His heart was breaking for his Jewish countrymen. They were trying to establish their own righteousness. But they had not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God because they had not submitted themselves to Christ. Don't make this mistake. There are so many people making this mistake today. They think that by going to their church and by living a good life and by doing all these things that somehow it will make them right. Surely God will open the pearly gates for them and it doesn't work that way. If you have not submitted yourself unto Christ, you are not made righteous. But when you have the righteousness of Christ, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have that peace. So if you do not have that peace, bow your your head today and simply say, Lord, save me. I put my faith in you alone. And then in the midst of this pandemic, and this fearful, troubling time, you can have peace in the midst of the storm through Christ and Christ alone. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of thy servant, Paul. 
and help us to repudiate that which is not of Christ and help us to lean upon him every day the one who is our friend, our saviour, our guide our heavenly brother we thank you for him write your word upon every heart keep your hand upon us through the course of this week be with us as we join together on Wednesday night for the Bible study and prayer be with us Lord May thy grace continue with us for Christ's sake. Amen. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me has been made. to him.